Thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's it. I had a good conversation earlier today with with Lama Mitchell, and we were, you know, it's been an interesting path for us. You know, I think anytime you come out of a retreat like that, it's a. I mean, we're still kind of figuring it all out, and um, we were both talking about how we can be real self critical. Um, I think because we have we had Campbell Carter Ribshe as a teacher, and like then sit in places where he sat and and try to to teach something is like really daunting you know and i think a lot of times we're thinking like what why should i even be here and but we had we came today to, we I, we recognize you know there there is things that we learned and we learned a lot of things from Kepa Carter Rinpoche and even if it's just that we've absorbed a lot of the teachings from the lineage and we remember them well and can explain them accurately we don't have to be realized <laughs> so I feel like we kind of let ourselves off the hook in our conversation today and it was a little bit of a relief I think for both of us to kind of come to that recognition um, but Let's start. Uh, let's do the the refuge vow first, and I think we can keep it kind of informal tonight too, since we have a small group. And hey, yeah, uh, this is remember this is California. Oh yeah, you got it, baby. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, we'll do uh, one time in Tibetan, once in English, once in Tibetan. Oh, Sangye Chidang Soki Chodnamla. Shanchu Badu Dagni Kapsuchi Daki Jin Sogi Pe Sunamki Drola Pinchi Sangye Druparsho. I take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha until I reach enlightenment. By the merit of accomplishing the six perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. O Sangye Chidang Soki Chodnamla Janchu Padu Dagni Kapsuji Dagi Jin Soki Pe Sunamki Rola Pinchi Sangye Druparjo Alden Sawila Marin Boje, Dagi Jiwa Bede Denjula, Alden Jabogone Jason Te Kusun to King Yudrup Sadu. So all right so this is the third in our living the dream series which is loosely based on payment children's living beautifully with uncertainty and change and um we started out talking about the commitment to do no harm uh related with um, the first cycle of the buddha's teaching and then um moved on to the commitment to take care of one another last time, particularly the Bodhisattva vow. And this time we'll be talking about, um, kind of loosely about the Samaya vow, but really we're just gonna keep it practical tonight because um, I took a different approach this time. Like I realized that um, I had kind of gotten into this whole other corner than where I was when I first got out of retreat. Cause when I first came out of retreat, I, you know, Lama Kathy, I've been lucky enough to work with her a lot these last two years. And I always loved how she just kind of goes up there. She may have notes, but she just talks, you know? And so it was my goal um, to do that. And so that's how I did it. Right. When I got out of retreat, I had notes and I would just make myself do it. And I'd be super nervous and I would talk really fast and, um, and sometimes I would go down dead ends and, but I, but I did it, you know? And then when we got to where the center was going to open and I saw that big room and the big tall columns and, um, you know, and was invited to, to speak for you guys and things like that. I mean, I started to realize like, maybe I need to clean this all up. So I kind of got to where I just wrote everything out and I just moved to this whole other extreme of fully scripted everything. And, um, and then I had this experience where we had a Q&A session at KTC and and I realized like I was, I was all of a sudden me like again, like I could actually just be me and have like a conversation and and still 
you know, I did, I, you know, the whole place didn't, you know, I was going to say burn down, but that's not funny, but the, the whole, whole place didn't explode, you know, just because I, all of a sudden I didn't have a script in front of me. And so I realized that I need to find a little balance there, you know, and, and it actually worked out really good timing wise, because um, one way we can talk about uh, the approach in the Vajrayana and particularly in, you know, some of the core meditations of like deity visualization is like vivid and insubstantial. This idea of like having a balance between um, clarity and detail and a little bit of uncertainty and, and groundlessness. And um, that's, I value both of those uh, a lot in, in art especially, you know, um, any kind of experience where we're kind of in it together and we don't really know what it's going to be. Um, but we have a little bit of an idea, you know, um, there's, there's some, some guardrails, but there's also some, a great chance for surprise and collaboration, even, even if it's just like energy coming together that makes something happen, I think is important. So, um, so I took a little different approach this time and, and, you know, just kind of did some notes again, and I'm sure, I'm sure we'll all be fine. And um, so I, I want to actually just share a couple stories, I think, because there's just been some stuff this week that happened that uh, I think relates to this idea of this commitment to embrace the world just as it is, which is the way Pema Chodron uh, phrases this in the book. And I love that, the commitment to embrace the world just as it is. Um, it's a challenging idea, um, especially nowadays. And so it's worth um, noting that the previous commitments uh, remain in place and are actually the foundation of being able to do something like embrace the world just as it is. So we have to think about um, not causing harm to ourselves or others. We have to, and Specifically, like we talked about, we don't have uh, we have to make sure that we're not um, acting out because of some sort of uh, attachment or aversion to our experience, and that we're not repressing the things we're experiencing. We need to actually cultivate the ability to just be present with our situation, even when we're not doing the stuff we want to do. If we want to speak up. Um, do things that could hurt other people or ourselves. Like we need to refrain, but we need to not repress. So there's this balance of getting used to um, the discomfort, but by not doing. And then when we get to the uh, second commitment of committing to take care of each other, then we get to this place where we actually have to start um, moving outward again and doing things actively for other people that may take us out of our comfort zone. And uh, an interesting thing I, I uh, conversation I had with a student this week, I think sometimes when uh, an individual who's in a committed relationship starts on the Dharma path, uh, I've seen this happen um, kind of often that if one, one person's a Dharma practitioner and one person isn't, there's a period where the person who is not the Dharma practitioner is really happy that the person's meditating uh, because they become more tranquil, they start to see the the benefits of meditation for that individual. But then after a while, because there's not as much engagement with strong emotion, and maybe not as much willingness to talk about it a lot, you know, to like uh, ruminate or steam or, you know, just kind of complain, um, that can actually make people feel like there's less emotional connection. And I think that's not an uncommon thing to happen in a situation where one person is a practitioner and the other other one isn't, because that that wish to connect, I think a lot of times for us means engaging in like a lot of speech that may not really be helpful and that stokes uh, anger or jealousy or pride or any of those things, you know, even ignorance. Um, and so I think there is a lot of times a perception that like there's less connection because there's less um, just kind of stoking of emotions between two people who are close. And that was probably a big part of their communication for a long time. And, and I thought it was interesting because that kind of is a, a real clear um, 
sort of entry into the Mahayana there, because in the beginning, it's pretty easy to just not do stuff and not harm. Uh, but then at some point in those situations, usually that Dharma practitioner has to start now actively doing some things that may take them out of their comfort zone. Not necessarily, I don't mean going back to like complaining and, and being involved in, in emotional kind of stuff, o- overtly and unnecessarily emotional kind of conversations or, you know, knocking other people. But um, at the same time, maybe there's other neat ways that we need to show that we still care and that we're connected and we may need to figure out what those are. We need to, may need to experiment and it may just be like extra time, but in any case, there's going to be a little bit of active discomfort, you know, like engaging in such a way, kind of just reaching, reaching out a little bit, hopefully uh, within our limits, you know, we like, that's a key with all of this is, is being cognizant of what we can and can't do and not, putting ourselves in a position where we may hurt people because we're um, beyond what we can safely handle. So I think it's important to be aware, but to take those little risks and push ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit so that we can help other people and take care of them. And when we get to this third uh, cycle of the Buddhist teaching, the Vajrayana, we kind of put those together and, and now we're uh, doing all the things we did before but everything is uh, on the table to be worked with and nothing is excluded. And we still need to be careful, but the idea is that everything is, uh, everything is the teacher in one sense or another. So for instance, we talk about the threefold bearing, you know, considering all form to be the body of, of the teacher, all sound to be sacred sound, mantra, and the nature of all thought to be uh, enlightened mind, enlightened wisdom. And um, so if we can maintain that kind of a view, that actually uh, is what ensures keeping all samayas. So the samaya commitment that comes along with many Vajrayana practices, uh, there are, are really long lists of all the ways we can break samaya, but there's one easy way to always keep it which is to maintain that threefold bearing. If we if we could <laughs> always remember that everything we see is the teacher and everything we hear is mantra and everything that uh, uh, the nature of all thought, not necessarily content, but the nature of all thought is wisdom, um, we would keep all samayas. And it's actually kind of the easy way to remember how to keep your samaya. Um, but that's a really, really hard thing to do obviously and so uh samaya is a thing that uh it needs constant maintenance and there's uh an analogy of it being sort of like trying to keep dust off of a mirror you know like it as soon as you clean the mirror you're seeing dust again you know and so you're, you're in this constant cycle of of keeping it clean and similarly you're in this constant cycle with samaya of doing your best to keep it and also taking the measures to uh repair it And, um, and that's okay. You know, that's, that is itself a process, you know, and that, that's what it's, it's going to be. And it still makes it worth taking the commitment, you know, if it's something that you're ready to do for a certain practice. Um, and then in working with this idea of embracing the world, just as it is, we luckily have these incredible techniques of deity meditation, which are, uh, just amazing, amazing, skillful means. Uh, it just makes me speechless even starting to think about how incredible they are and how lucky we are to, to be exposed to them. And one of the basic practices in this lineage is Chenrezig practice. And that's often one of the first uh, meditations we learn in the mantra uh, path, you know, where we're visualizing deities and, um, I see a hand raised. Does somebody have a question? I just saw that. Sorry. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I don't know if it's the right time to ask a question. Sure. I'll take one though. Okay. Um, For some reason, the um, imagining that all sound is mantra and all thoughts have wisdom as their nature hold on a sec 
Mm-hmm. Sorry, I, I have uh, the screen split and I didn't, I had the, that's why I missed the hand earlier. Okay, I'm back. Um, but the part about, what did you say again? Every form is, is the guru? Like basically everything you see. So all a form meaning like everything that, 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 uh, yeah, everything you see. Yeah. For some reason I have trouble with that. I mean, it's, I don't understand what I'm doing. I mean, I see a tree. I, I could see like maybe with a person, but I see a tree, I see a car, I see a house. How, how am I supposed to imagine that's the guru? <laughs> Well, see, another way to say see in, in the case of like seeing everything, seeing all form as the guru is understanding it is inseparable from. That's maybe a better way to say it, you know, that like recognizing that that all form is inseparable from the guru and all um, speech is I like inseparable from means. mantra. So yeah. um yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense, and and, and kind of in and in one sense, getting what that means is the whole is kind of the whole path, you know. So coming to better understand how that applies, and I think the easiest way to start to uh, because it is so profound, we have chin raising practice, you know, and we have these practices where we visualize the deity, and. Yeah. And so the, another way, with, before I get into that, like another way to say it would be recognizing, number one, that all your experience is a mental experience, you know, that whatever we, um, you know, yes. even if we're just looking at something, it's our mind, right, that sees that. And it's our, our eye faculty, you know, allows it to come in, our eye consciousness um, processes it goes or well sends it to the mental consciousness so everything that we experience whether there's something out there or not we it's a it's our mind that um with with which we experience okay. things okay that makes it a little bit more palatable yeah yeah so and we know that that's actually buddha nature you know what i mean like our our awareness in, in our mind it, it is is obscured at, at the moment but it is and always will be Buddha nature and isn't changed um, by us seeing uh, yeah. seeing the guru or not seeing the guru. It's still still Buddha nature. And because of that, that whole experience is actually the teacher, you know, is is our our wisdom and and our guru and mantra. And so that makes more sense. Yes. OK, yeah. cool. Thank yeah. You. So this you're welcome. Yeah, it it, it is. Um, it's so challenging, right? Because I mean, we see awful things too. And, um, but this idea of working with deity visualization, like Chen Rezik, um, there's this key instruction, right? That we see them as vivid and insubstantial. And the vividness is inseparable from the insubstantial. And the insubstantial is inseparable from the vivid. And coming to some, uh recollection you know stable recollection of that makes such a difference because we often think it's kind of one or the other and one of the first things we do it when we visualize i think is try to see it like we do with our eyes you know we try to see um you know we we wonder why our visualization practice doesn't look like it does when we're looking out our window and part of the reason for that is it's not a, a eye consciousness activity you know it's our mind it's a different you know we're not using the eyes but um but also there's this this part where um we solidify everything we, we yeah. think everything so to tie it back to like the hini on it we we t we think everything's permanent in some way or another i mean we say we know stuff's impermanent but we always kind of are shocked when things change um i remember the first the first Dharma talk I went to, Lama Yeshe Jump, so the translator um, was teaching then and was, I, I think, is a great teacher. And he he was talking about how, like, when you see a friend's kid, you know, and then you don't see him for like six years, and then you're like, oh, you're so big. And he was like, what am I, an idiot? 
You know, like, of course they've gotten bigger. It's 60 years later, you know, but we're still shocked. And so we have this habitual, deeply ingrained tendency to solidify um, thinking. So and, and solidify is exactly what I mean by impermanent. Solidify is more like not recognizing that things are collections, that nothing is a singular thing. Everything is arises interdependently. So whatever we're experiencing is, is not just its own independent, permanent thing it's always like the coming together of different pieces and parts and causes and conditions and um so for instance i don't know if, if did you anybody here see that news story about the mirror that they found at the cincinnati museum of art and it there's this ancient mirror and i guess this was a, a form of art at the time or something but nobody had thought to test this it's it looks when i say mirror i'm talking about like if you've ever seen the tibetan mirrors it's not like actually clear it's just kind of a piece of metal that's shiny and um and they they put a light on it and it projected an image of amitabha onto the wall and no one had known this forever you know it's like ancient chinese art and that light shone on it and then there was buddha amitabha on the wall and immediately i was like that's perfect for the talk right because that's an interdependent you know appearance like clearly it's there we clearly see it. Um, it's Amitabha, but there's nothing really there. It's it's appearance, but it's empty. It's arising because of all these interdependent factors. There's a light shined at the mirror. The mirror's got a wall to reflect on. We have the the faculty of vision, you know, and the recognition of what it is um, that we're seeing. So there's all these different interdependent factors that came together to make this vivid and insubstantial image of Amitabha. And so that's kind of that that key point of visualizing things as vivid and insubstantial extends off of the cushion too, you know, and, and ideally will come with us into the world um, in everything we do. Uh, recognizing that we do see stuff, but that stuff isn't how we think it is you know it's it's a little insubstantial it's a little uncertain um it's interdependent and it's a, it, in a way it's really simple that why why wouldn't we just try to see stuff as insubstantial when when we are always making this mistake about the permanence of, of things or this mistake about the singularity of things so that these practices like chinrezik um alone you know just doing them it, it's a surprising thing i think because we can't really tell how they work and that's a funny thing about uh like shamatha is a is an uh an exoteric practice this is uh charlie grubache's words i'd never heard that word before exoteric but he said shamatha is exoteric because the um instruction is simple but then the actual doing of the practice is like that's where all the magic happens, right? Like you can, your shamatha practice can develop over years and years and years. Um, but it's kind of clear what you're doing. You know, I mean, we, it's, it, we're trying to place the attention and if we get distracted, we bring the attention back. That's really, it's all out there on the table, you know, what it's going to lead to and the challenges we meet. Um, that's the whole wealth of other stuff. But when we come to something like uh, Chinrezik practice, um, the instructions, are, are kind of complex but like what it's gonna do it seems weird right like i mean I, when i first came to maybe that was just me but when i first came to the stuff i was like why are we chanting all this stuff what is this weird imagery that we're being told to visualize you know it doesn't it doesn't um it's not absolutely clear why it's going to do something or what effects it's going to bring about. So it's esoteric. Like these are esoteric practices. The instructions are pretty clear, but what they're going to do is who knows, you know, like, I mean, in, in, you just have to kind of do it and start to learn how, how they impact you. And so this vivid and insubstantial aspect, you know, making sure that we're getting familiar with, not just emptiness, which is where we really were on the last talk when we were talking about uh, the Mahayana and Tonglen. There's a lot of focus there on recognizing insubstantiality. And there's a lot of focus in the Hinayana 
on like the vivid aspect because it's in the Hinayana, we don't even really examine whether phenomena are real. We kind of take it for granted and then we learn about karma and we learn about interdependence. It's the level of like slight analysis. So we, we're dealing a lot with the vivid aspects of things in the Hinayana. And then in the Mahayana, we talk a lot about emptiness, voidness, um, lack of reference point. And then there's this union in the Vajrayana where we bring those two together and we say that those two have to coexist. Like they have to be found to be insubstantial. I'm sorry, they have to found found to be inseparable. And um, that's a challenge. Number one, because we love vivid stuff and we spend a whole lot of time looking at the vivid stuff and thinking about the vivid stuff and being sure that we need to know all the vivid stuff. Um, one of the ways I was thinking about approaching this talk, but I, I didn't, was I, I, at some point I wanted to do a talk about some advice on studying because I think that is a place where we get real hung up on the vivid aspect. Like we want to know all the stuff. We want to know all the facts and, you know, the more names we know and concepts we know and all that stuff, like it's um, can be beneficial, you know, but the funny thing is that like insights in meditation, like real insights into the nature of mind will always be non-conceptual. So these ideas that, um, for instance, like early on, when we start doing shamatha, I think everybody probably has some experience of, of like, um, you know, first you're fighting pain in the knees and then it's distraction and stuff like that, uh, you know, gross distractions like noises in the house or what you're angry about from the day before. But at some point, pretty quickly, I think our minds go like, oh, you know what will really get him? If I make him think he just figured out the meaning of life. Then he'll stop and get stuck on that for a while and maybe even write it down and I'll totally get him to stop meditating. You know, like I think that happens early on for a lot of people. But those those insights, um, I think in a lot of ways, I think those insights are actually like a contemplation. You know, like you've contemplated something to come to some sort of conceptual idea, but then you still need to meditate, you know, like the meditation like it, the three stages of practice are said to be listening, contemplation, and meditation. So these realizations we have that have to do with new stuff that we know, you know, that actually lands in the conceptual realm. And we still at some point have to rest in the nature of our mind. And working with visualizing Chinrezig, for instance, um, we often start, uh, one instruction is to start from the head and move down and just do like sort of like uh, the top knot or the jewel that's right on top of his head. So you kind of look at that image of the jewel and then look away and see if you can see it with your mind's eye. And immediately we have to remind ourselves, um, okay, I can see what that looks like, but I got to imagine it is made of light insubstantial because it's not our go-to, you know, that, that, I think in most cases is one of the most challenging parts to get training ourselves and to be able to see detail without tying it together with an idea of solidity. And so we work our way down. So we might go down to like uh, below, there's the one jewel, there may be two jewels, and then there's a crown. Maybe we see the eyes, just visualize the eyes for a while. Then we can add maybe where the ears are too. And then are we still vivid and insubstantial or are we just vivid again you know it, these are the kind of things we have to keep checking back on and um i think that uh remembering that kind of thing again off the cushion becomes incredibly important because um particularly when things are challenging um when we're distressed or you know under stress in, in any way um that's when it's the easiest to forget the insubstantial part and to kind of really start to retreat into that vividness part and that's when we start to think things are a really 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 big deal you know and that's when we start to forget that whatever's going on um is impermanent 
and we start to forget that whatever is going on um, will, you know, probably has a whole lot of things coming together. We may not really know the situation in its entirety. We probably only know our relative view could be something bad for us, but could be helping a hundred other people. We don't really know. Um, we also tend to forget that like, again, this could all be our teacher. You know, this could all, we could be learning from all of this. And one thing Payment Children talks about in, in the last chapter of this book is the idea of charnel ground practice. And charnel ground is, is a pretty vivid kind of image that we hear a lot about in uh, tantric practice. And the idea is that in Tibet, the ground was uh, frozen most of the year. So there was no way to do ground burials when people passed away. So there were just these areas where um, bodies were taken to be consumed by, you know, predators and uh, birds and, you know, any kind of scavengers. So just these outdoor areas with death and impermanence everywhere and vividly, right? Like, like body parts, like strewn around at various states of decay. And these are places where uh, yogis would go to meditate on purpose in the midst of these vivid reminders of impermanence and death and change and insubstantiality. And it's not recommended that we do that if we're not uh, at a certain level. Um, that came up when we did uh, should uh, teaching at KTC. People said, should we go to a cemetery and practice there? And uh, Lama Yeshe was like, probably not a good idea, you know, because there are there may be forces there at play that we're not ready for. But um, but this idea of like being right in the middle of all of that greatness and, you know, life and death, like it's all there vividly. And then being in the middle of that boldly, you know, and carrying out our practice, you know, trying to be present um, in the situation and with our mind as it is. And um, she gives a practice, like we talked in the previous two talks about a three-step practice, uh, be present, feel your heart, and then engage the next moment without an agenda. And it's a really good practice, um, if you can remember it. She modifies it for this, and I'll read you her instructions. She says, begin by coming fully into the present. Then standing or sitting, take your place joyfully, fearlessly, and confidently in the midst of the chaos and pain of your life. So that's the first step. Second step is feel your heart and sense that this unpleasant place is workable, that sanity exists here. Allow yourself to soften and become tender, more appreciative, and more inquisitive. And finally, she says, then take the leap into the next moment, suddenly free from fixated mind, as Chogun Trumpa put it. Go forward with compassion and an open mind. So um, I think to the degree that we've gained some ability with the commitment to do no harm and the commitment to take care of others, um, that's going to be a big factor in how much of this charnel ground practice that she she call as she calls it we can do and it initially probably needs to be like seconds really to be safe um, but if you think about karma and habits and how often we're just mindlessly reactive even just taking a few seconds to do that practice is incredibly impactful because that's breaking the inertia like, whereas we would have just sort of mindlessly gone into something selfish or uh, something to repress or act out, um, if we can even just for a moment take her advice in this practice, you know, um, be present, to, to put it simply, you know, be present, feel our heart and engage the next moment without an agenda, um, that, may, that makes a big, big difference. And I think it's always really important, maybe 
one of the most important things to find ways of practicing this stuff with seemingly meaningless things, you know, seemingly meaningless little annoyances. Um, honestly, like even things like, like sometimes I'll be a little uncomfortable in my chair and I'll go, I'm not going to move yet. I mean, it's so simple, but like, it's a way that you can actually just engage for a minute in these small manageable chunks. And, and that's how we have to start to train for the big, you know, seemingly unmanageable chunks. I want to tell this story. I don't even know if it's related, but I thought it was really funny. I went to the dump the other day. My mom has these, this carpet remnants that she needed thrown out. So I found that we had a dump around here and I'd never really been to a dump before. And of course, there's a whole system at the dump that I was unaware of. And I pull up and there were two lanes, but you have to go in this lane if you're not like an employee. And it's a scale, this big, you drive up on this, it looks almost like a bridge and it's a scale. And um, and so immediately I was kind of like, oh, what am I doing? I go over here, oh, here, okay, okay I'm going to go through here. And then I, so I pull up onto this, this scale thing and pull up there's a car there's like a booth you know where there's like the attendants there and there's a car in front of me and i pull up behind the car in front of me and the woman leans out the window is like she's going like back up back up and and my first thought was like well that's rude like what what am i and then i thought well okay i'll, I'll back up i'll back up and then i back up and i see there's like a traffic light that was at the beginning of that scale and of course they don't want me on the scale with the person in front of me because that's how they track what's coming in and out and stuff. But because I was a little overwhelmed pulling in there, um, I kind of stopped thinking. I, I kind of disengaged for the moment and got a little dumber, you know, and pulled up behind this person. And of course, I'm going to all these selfish strategies. I'm thinking like, what a mean lady for doing, you know, treating me that way you know like i'm thinking she must you know i mean i didn't stay there long but it did it was the first thing that came to my mind you know like what a rude way to treat somebody you know and then of course the light turns green and i pull up there and she's a wonderful person she's got a great sense of humor you know like she's she's like you didn't see the traffic light haven't you ever seen a traffic light before and you just really she was really sweet of course you know it was all of this was me projecting you know she needed me to back up she needed somehow to tell me that and um, but so I kind of, I was like a little overwhelmed and I wasn't smart when I was overwhelmed. I wasn't able to stay engaged, you know, to really kind of take in the vividness and the reality of the situation I was in, in a skillful way. And so then I went, I, I dumped off the carpet and I came back and, um, there's another scale on the way out. That's how they charge you. And so I knew it, I was thinking, I'm not going to go through the traffic light this time, you know? And so I waited at the traffic light, this person that was in front of me, I'm so proud of myself person pulls off i pull right up to the window and she goes you did it again and i was like what and she was like i had the light red because the guy was coming out to walk across there and you just drove right through and i was and i realized i didn't look at the light i just watched the car leave and then i went so again i was like distracted by my own stories in the moment um just a, a mindless kind of embarrassing story that i'm happy to share because it's funny too but um but it really just highlighted for me like how much we check out um with even the littlest bit of discomfort you know even like the littlest little bit we can all that mindfulness that we practice on the cushion can kind of just evaporate and and then when it does we become more protective of our territory you know i'm thinking like how awful this person is to me um immediately that's right where my mind went and um and how much more work is there to be done <laughs> you know like especially if even in those like kind of situations that seem pretty innocuous can bring up these negative emotions you know like anger actually you know and it's in its core you know when one of the other things i remember lamayashi saying in that that teaching um was that uh any like the spark of aggression to our situation it, or even I, I can't remember exactly his quote i want to say it was like the spark of like resistance to a situation is anger like that, that's what that that's what that is so like it, it may be just a little you know and it may be gone real fast and we may just sort of label it as like um i think sometimes we label that stuff as even like rational thought right because it's like well i should get angry at that because everybody 
gets angry at that or i should it should be okay that i don't want that to happen who would want that to happen but any of that resistance is actually the beginning of the process of anger and um so we need to be able to catch this stuff quickly and to be engaged and so i guess to try to wrap it up uh in, in a sort of neat way um we want to awaken that's the idea here like buddha means awake so really what we're trying to do is wake up and be present and that means fully cultivating our awareness and stabilizing it so uh, really just revealing that awareness but getting it um open unimpeded and um and that alone clears away the ignorance right now that that clouds our true nature so waking up really means never checking out you know never shutting down um never really allowing ourselves to dip into these habits of seeing things as they aren't you know so um engaging with our mandala you know with that in mind because really our everything we experience is our mandala and we need to hopefully see that as our teacher and see everyone in it as our teacher and all the stuff that happens in it as our teacher i think a lot of times we feel like things and 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 people are intruding on our mandala you know like they're like kind of coming in there and messing up our chances uh to 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 wake up but it it's opposite you know like we all of those people are there at, and there there are riches on on you know, on this path in order to be able to wake up. And we may not be able to see them as Chen Rezik, you know, or as the teacher that we may not be able you know, to do that yet. Um, we may not be able to do it all the time. Uh, we may not be able to actively take care of some of those people. We may not have the capability to do that yet. Um, we may have to generate compassion but maybe not in the same room with them you know or we may have to put a little diff distance if we need if it's just not safe because you know we don't have the capability to do that yet um and i'm kind of moving backwards here right so like there's the vivid and substantial embracing the world just as it is there's taking care of one another and then sometimes there's just doing no harm you know and so Sometimes that's what we have to do. Maybe that's the best the best method uh, is to just do our best to not hurt ourselves or anyone else. But in any case, we've got a mandala. It's going to be there. Hopefully at some point we'll see it as a pure realm, you know, but, um, and we'll see it as vivid and insubstantial and we'll see all the Buddhas and we'll be in, uh, inseparable from them. Uh, but in the meantime, we can start by just cultivating that idea that everything is vivid and insubstantial and we've got some really skillful ways of of training in that you know in this lineage uh with with chenrezig practice and green tara and and all of those things so on the one hand this is practical stuff we can apply day to day just kind of trying to recall that vividness and that insubstantiality is inseparable or recall the threefold bearing you know of seeing all form as the teacher hearing all sound as sacred sound and um, recognizing that the nature of all thought is enlightened wisdom. Um, but we also have these practices and that those practices lead to those results. You know, so there it there's three ways of doing it. They all support each other. You know, there may be more ways than that too, but um, that's three kind of that we talked about today. So I would encourage everyone to try to be involved in some kind of practice like that, some kind of um, Chenrezig or Green Tara or Nunye or whatever, those practices may not, uh, we may not see the ways that they work so readily like we do with Tonglen per se, but they do have a huge effect. And it's also the quickest effect. You know, that's one of the main reasons to engage in the Vajrayana is because it's gonna handle, it's gonna move us the fastest. You know, they say like m maximum of seven lifetimes. So, um, yeah yeah so i think we're really lucky and um so grateful to kim carter Rinpoche and lama kathy and um everyone who's shared these practices with me and stuck with me as i ask a whole lot of questions and um 
you know, I, I guess one last thing I'll say is like, it's funny because in, in retreat, we did a, a ton of these kinds of practices. I mean, that's what the three year retreat is, is like all um, Bajriana practices. And so everything's got a visualization and the visualizations are often super complex. And um, Rinpoche gave incredibly clear instructions and really good transcripts, transcripts that are used all around the world in three-year retreats now. Um, his, his transcripts, because they were that well done and well respected. Um, but still, we would think of stuff and be like, well, but what about if the light goes from there, how does it come around here to the left? You know, like little questions like that would always come up because we want to know the details we're, we want. We're really about figuring stuff out. And he would almost always, he, sometimes he would have, a, you know, it, it's not that all questions are bad, but a common answer he would have is it. Don't worry about it. You've got the information you need, you know, just work with that. You know, so we wanted the vivid to be super vivid. And he was saying, I, I think he was saying like, there's going to be some insubstantial in there too. You got to work with it. <laughs> so thank you. Any, any questions or conversation? I have a question. Sure. Um, is this is this method that you're that you're describing? Um, is it? It seems to me that it's. Um, it also leads to um, the idea of having sacred view, of creating um, sacred space um, for you. You know, in in your life. Um, is that is that true? Is that is this method? Does this method? help with that it seems like it would seems like it would kind of lead to that that idea of, of creating sacred space um and a sacred you know vase for for um your life um and the way you conduct your life yeah and that's actually one of the things that we we talk about in terms of uh of these practices is generating sacred view like that's a that's actually a, the exact words that are in a lot of these transcripts about this stuff, you know, is um, really seeing, you know, for instance, when Chinrezic practice ends, the post meditation is to see all beings as inseparable from Chinrezic and yourself too. And it, it really is kind of a recognition that we're already in a, in a pure realm, you know we're already we're already there you know i mean obviously we have to we've got some work to do to, to stabilize that recognition but um and that's and in a sense so, so the point there is and this was one of the most impactful things i ever heard lama kathy say it's actually like much closer to the truth for us to visualize like this than it is for us to see ourselves as all limited and you know un, you know uh not wise you know all the ways we see ourselves now as being centralized in a self and you know um we're just we're too hard on ourselves and we don't recognize we obviously don't recognize our true nature we don't recognize that limitless and compassionate unlimited wisdom and compassion that we have within ourselves um so it's actually much closer to the truth to think of ourselves as chen raising i mean it, in a way it's just like an imagination game but um, but actually, it's closer than than what we we think the whole rest of the time. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. I like that. That helps. It, it, yeah, it helps a lot. It feels a little weird at first to do the right to do these practices. Like yeah, I definitely I mean, felt that yeah. way. Yeah, I was like, I felt the same way you did when I first I didn't quite understand. That was years ago. Mm -hmm. Is it okay to do the Chenrezi? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> go ahead, Lisa. Ask. You first. <laughs> I was just going to say, I really like, I really love Pema Chodin. And one of the first things that Pema Chodin, well, one of her first books that I read and one of the quotes that came with it was chaos can be a gift. 
and our chaos is a gift or something like that. Well, the bottom line is chaos can be a gift. And at the time, my life was always so chaotic. And it really got me to stop and slow down just that one idea. And so what you're bringing to us and we're learning here tonight is I think also as well as in creating the sacred space. Thank you for that, Susan. That's and Lama Adam, it's just all of this is just slowing down to stop to remember that this is all really possible if we let it in. And so just thanks so much for all of this because it really gives a, a lot to think about. It just does. So thank you. Wow, you're welcome. Thank you. There's I, I there is a quote in here. I don't know if this is the one that you heard, but the first that that for this section of the book, she quotes Trumpa Rinpoche and says, chaos should be regarded as extremely good news. It's a little different, but that in itself too, that's fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad that that you guys have taken some value from this because um yeah, it's it's a it's a funny area to, to talk about, right? Because it's like so profound. And we're talking about two seemingly contradictory things, vividness and insubstantiality. But it's also the most practical side of it because everything's included. You know, there's we can't exclude anything in our life from this kind of practice. By by definition, this it, it, you know, everything is in here and every part of your life can become an opportunity. Right. Should we, uh, Lisa, did you have a more? Um, I, what I, I saw you click on and off. I know, oh, you <laughs> saw that? Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> so these are perfect days for chaos. So this is perfect opportunity for learning. Is that, yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. what, what, how would you recommend, like, so like watching the news and like reading about things. And so is that like a good way to practice about how not to get angry, but sort of read it but not really you know what i mean yeah yeah that's a good question um i think it really depends on each of us i mean i don't know if you've ever done like a a break from media um, oh yeah They're that's really yeah yeah that's that's probably rather than like um let me think about that for a second but i think i think my first suggestion would be like the best practice would be to work with the feeling of wanting to check the news and not you know because that is connecting with the basic discomfort you know connecting with that basic feeling of what the buddha meant with so suffering fun. but if you hear you know if you, you're like for instance like i can't believe that news is still on in doctor's offices like we're there to like improve our health and like i'm listening to yeah. this stuff that's like kind of upsetting you know <laughs> and yeah. So like if you're in a, if you're a captive audience for that kind of stuff, you know, um, that's where, for instance, like, like sometimes what I'll do in terms of like thinking about the sacred sound thing is treat whatever I'm hearing as the, the support for my meditation, you know, just kind of try to just put my attention on the sound, but without really engaging with the words, you know, can I just listen, you know, and if you can start to do that, even just a little bit, it's not easy, but once you can kind of start to do it, then it's not that hard to also think like, since you're not engaging with the meaning, um, you can start to think like, that's mantra, you know, just have like a little confidence that you're, you're hearing sacred sound, you know, or, you know, when I, when I, sometimes I'll actually think like that's Rinpoche's voice, you know, and that yeah, can be pretty like, powerful. Yeah. I'm try that <laughs> yeah and that's why like i love like in lama kathy's uh uh document she put together for short chin raising she she always says that um the nature of thought not the content is light and yeah. wisdom so that's an important thing with words and stuff to remember like it's it's not necessarily the content but <laughs> definitely the nature yeah thank you you're welcome Anyone else? I'll leave with one quote and then we'll dedicate the merit. There's a quote in this book um, 
we didn't get to go into this too much, but this is something for contemplation. Um, it's from a Zen master named Dogen. And the quote is, uh, to know the self is to forget the self. To forget the self is to be enlightened by all things. Nice. Yeah. So let's um let's dedicate the merit of tonight. Um, thank you so much for having me. Like I really appreciate being invited into your community, and and thank you for letting the the new guy get some practice, and start to build up my chops a little bit. So thank you, um, and I hope that uh, I brought you something that was useful, and I rejoice in all the activity of the great. Uh, masters in our lineage and, and all authentic teachers and I hope they stick around and, and continue to turn the deal, wheel of dharma and with all of that in mind uh, let's dedicate the merit by this merit may all beings obtain the omniscience of buddhahood and defeat our common enemy wrongdoing from the stormy waves of birth old age sickness and death from the ocean of samsara may we free all beings May we free all beings. May we free all beings. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Lama. Be well. Good night.